Welcome, everyone. This is our second networking forum. I think we'll, that we were overwhelmed a little bit by the response that we got, and that is a very positive version of being overwhelmed. And with that, let me turn things over. I'm Jesse goldberg Strasser with the Lansing Lugnuts. We have a great panel here, and it's going to be led by the voice of the Portland Sea Dogs, Emma Tiedemann. Thank you so much, Jesse, and welcome to everybody. I'm happy to see all the faces still popping up. Um, we'll make this pretty short for at least for our introduction so we can get into the, the real meat and potatoes side of things. Um, but I'll introduce the panel um, and I'll let each of them tell a little bit about their background, um, how they came to their jobs today. Um, and then we'll jump into a lot of the questions um, that y'all submitted um, and, and kind of go from there. If you have any questions during this time, feel free to just pop them in the chat. Uh, we'll kind of, I'll look at both um, as we as we go and um, yeah, we'll have some fun. So I'll introduce myself first. Uh, like Jesse said, I'm Emma Tiedemann. Um, I'm the current voice of the Portland Sea Dogs. Uh, I've been broadcasting for over 15 years now. Um, I got my start in high school. Uh, my grandfather was a broadcaster and uh, one day had an extra headset uh, for a women's basketball game and the rest is history, as they would say. Um, I fell in love with play-by-play -play, um, and hearing his stories. Actually, in an odd coincidence, he was the former broadcast partner of Harry Carey. Uh, Josh is in the on the panel right now. They called White Sox games together. So a cool coincidence that uh, <laughs> that a couple of uh, grandkids of broadcasters are in this. But um, I started really calling every game in high school, every sport in high school that I could shifted to more of a baseball focus in 2014 and has been, I've been working in baseball ever since. It's taken me from Alaska to Oregon, St. Paul, Minnesota, Lexington, Kentucky, and now to Maine. So basically Alaska to Maine, I've called baseball and I've loved every second of it. Um, so it's why I like, I have the passion to have, help people get into this industry because I think it's the best. Um, so with that, we, I'm going to pass it to our reigning broadcaster of the year, Alex Cohen. And he's on mute, broadcaster of the year, but can't work a microphone. I'm going to go on mute right now. Hi, guys. I'm here. Uh, in my spare time, I like drawing all the artwork that's on Emma's, uh, you know, inner booth right now to the right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm an artist. Uh, yeah, so my name is Alex Cohen. Uh, I've been broadcasting minor league baseball for 15 years. Uh, like Emma, I have my states and time zones, and I've, I've really – uh, hit all those functions as part of my minor league baseball trek. Uh, started with the Huntsville Stars uh, back in 2012. They are no longer the AA affiliate for the Brewers, uh, now the Biloxi Shockers. But I was in Huntsville for two years. Uh, then I went to Oakland, California. I was a media relations and broadcasting assistant with the Oakland Athletics. Uh, that summer taught me a lot. I got to sit back, learn, and I, I realized that I needed a microphone in front of my face, and I talk way too much uh, to be on the backside of it. So, uh, started from the ground up, went to the Australian Baseball League, called games in Melbourne, Australia for summer out there, fall out here, uh, then came back and was a rookie league affiliate uh, broadcaster for the Kansas City Royals, the Idaho Falls Chuckers for a summer, went to Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, was the Bowling Green Hot Rods voice, single A affiliate for the Tampa Bay Rays for two years, and then got the job in Iowa, December 14, 2017, it was negative 14 degrees, I thought that was perfect. So got the drive out here. I've been in Iowa for six years and uh, got the you know, Broadcaster of the Year Award this year. So like Emma's, my my trek is very wide ranging. And um, yeah, I mean, before that, went to school at Indiana University, broadcasted games in college, broadcasted games in high school, started the sports broadcasting club at my high school with two friends who are still in the industry. Uh, Stephen Watson, who is the pre and post game show host for the Milwaukee Brewers on Valley sports and Josh gets off, who is the play by play voice for the Pittsburgh Penguins on television. So all three of us went to the same high school and started the sports broadcasting club. And like Emma, I can't really imagine myself doing anything else. And I'm in this because I want more people to get into the industry like we did and make futures for ourselves like we did. So um, I'm honored to be part of the the group and help out. And uh, Emma, I appreciate the introduction. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we'll go now to Logan with Lake County. Hey, there, everybody. Uh, Logan Batoski. I'm the play-by-play uh, -play broadcaster for the Lake County Captains, the high A affiliate of the uh, Cleveland Guardians. I uh, just completed my first season with the team last year. Uh, I also uh, performed various media uh, 
uh, relations, responsibilities like game notes, uh, game recaps, making sure the roster's all up to date, everything like that. Uh, in terms of how I got into this industry, you know, I played sports throughout elementary, middle school, high school, and, you know, that realization came pretty quick. Probably not going to be playing at the next level, but I did want to stay involved in it and uh, do certainly enjoy talking sports and watching sports, listening to sports. I uh, had plenty of national and local broadcasters that I really uh, liked what they did. And I said, you know what? They bring this enthusiasm and excitement to these games that I would love to bring to other people too. Uh, and so I ended up uh, going to uh, Division Three John Carroll University, go Blue Streaks, and uh, worked in their uh, sports information office. I was the uh, I worked there for all four years. Uh, I was also our student radio station sports director. My last two years would have been longer, probably. Unfortunately, COVID hit, but uh, called various sports and games there. And through that, we actually had a brief radio deal with our radio station and the captains. So my the summer of my junior year, I was a radio intern where I uh, reduced games, cut highlights, uh, saved and compiled our interviews. But I also got to do color and a little bit of play by play at the ballpark as well. And then uh, last year, there was an opening for the broadcaster, and I was uh, very, very fortunate to be able to uh, get that spot. And uh, I've uh, really enjoyed uh, the entire experience so far. And uh, it's just great to see so many other people interested, and we're, do we're willing to do um, anything that we can to uh, help everyone get into this business. Thanks, Logan. Uh, let's now hear from Stephen Rice from Fresno. Hey everyone, my name is Stephen Rice. I am with the Fresno Grizzlies, the single A affiliate of the Colorado Rockies. Um, my background's a little bit crazy. My dad actually played professional baseball growing up, played for the Seattle Mariners with Ken Griffey Jr., Randy Johnson, so on and so forth. So literally was born into uh, baseball from the very moment and always had a passion for broadcasting, but uh, I never knew it was really a thing until I kind of got a little bit older and in college, I ended up working for uh, Bear News, which was our local radio station. And our professor allowed us to kind of get involved with the local uh, sports, whether it was hockey or basketball, and uh, start calling games. And so fell in love with the idea of broadcasting and wanted to be able to do it at the next level. And so I reached out to our previous broadcaster, uh, Doug Greenwald, and asked if there was an opportunity to come work for the Grizzlies as an intern. And he said, oh, there wasn't really anything broadcasting wise, but um, come try baseball communications. And so came over here doing media relations initially in 2016 as an intern. And somehow they've continued to want to keep me along here for the ride. And it's been now eight years, uh, starting in March will be eight years. And uh, this past year was my first year as the number one play by play broadcaster, but years of being a kind of a number two guy, uh, in this industry and then learning kind of the ropes of how to take over and can't wait for the second year of joining it, but big love of baseball. And I know everyone here has a love for talking baseball broadcasting in general and anything we can do to help you guys out. That's why we're part of this. So thank you for everyone who's here. And we can't wait to discuss more things. Thank you, Steven. Now let's move to John Kosis of Columbia. Hey guys, I'm John. I grew up as a lefty and Cleveland in the 90s so I wanted to be Jim Tomey growing up and I think it was about fourth or fifth grade where I found out I was not going to hit 600 home runs uh, I went to college at Ohio University and got involved with a couple of like summer league teams and hockey teams and ultimately decided that play-by-play -play was the thing for me got my professional career started off in West Virginia as a video production intern uh, with the then West Virginia Power and uh, you know moved on to a broadcast role the following year and then I moved to Hagerstown within the same league, and, and here I am in Columbia since 2020. Um, and then during the pandemic, I also wrote a book that profiles a bunch of the people in this room, like Alex, Emma, and uh, Jesse are in the book too. So uh, a lot of really cool stuff here, and I'm real excited to uh, share some stuff with you guys today. All right, next, uh, we're going to go to Josh Carey with Rocket City. And thank you, Emma. And by the way, I didn't know about that, uh, about our grandparents, so very cool. Um, yeah, my name's Josh Carey. Uh, grew up in baseball. Just Google the name. I think y'all will figure it out. Um, but yeah, I've done everything and anything in broadcasting. I've done 
minor league baseball. I was in news. I've reported. I've anchored. I've um, been a producer, uh, a desk assistant. I uh, was a college uh, basketball and football broadcaster for Stony Brook University. Um, and then a few years ago, as my mom was getting a little older, I wanted to move back south. And uh, that's when the opportunity with Rocket City just so happened to come up. Um, you know, obviously, I come from a long line of broadcasters. Currently, I have, in addition, two nephews who are killing it in Amarillo. So it's uh, pretty obvious that my family can't do anything else except broadcast baseball games. But um, I'm thrilled to be here. Happy to help you guys out uh, any way we can. Thank you, Josh. And last but not least, we'll have Jesse Goldberg Strassler. Hi, I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. This is John's book right there. Um, I'm the voice of the Lansing Lugnuts since 2009. And before that, I'm a proud Ithaca bomber. After graduating from Ithaca College in 2004, I could not get into the industry until the next year. I did not know how to break in. Finally, somebody said, go to the winter meetings. Maybe that will be your chance. And that helped me become a producer, board operator, media intern in Brockton, Massachusetts in 2005. Then I went back to the winter meetings in 2006. That led to me joining the Montgomery Biscuits for two years. And then after that, I got hired to be the voice of the Windy City Thunderbolts. So two different indie leagues, Can-Am and Frontier League, before joining the Lugnuts starting in 2009. And in between each of those seasons, I was a substitute teacher back home in Maryland. That to me, those jobs that came out of nowhere, those jobs that I didn't get, what you've already heard from people, that forming of relationships is integral. And so that's why I think this is important, that we get to meet all of you and you get to start building these relationships with us. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Jesse. And actually, it's a good lead into our first question. Um, again, if you have any questions in the chat, I see we already have some questions there. That's awesome. I'm going to address the questions to a couple panelists, but if anyone else wants to chime in, um, feel free. So uh, our first question, Jesse kind of addressed it. How do I get my foot in the door, break into the field and get reps? Uh, you know, you mentioned the job fair that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so with that gone, uh, let's start with Alex and Logan. Um, how would be the best way to get somebody's foot in the door who's trying to get into the industry? It's a big question. I'm unmuting again. No, that's um, that's a good question. And actually, Jesse brought up something uh, that before I get into details um, is interesting. Everybody talks about minor league baseball has to be affiliated baseball. Jesse broke in in indie ball. I initially broke in in indie ball in the Frontier League with the Gateway Grizzlies. Emma, you broke into indie ball in St. Paul. So it's not just about affiliated ball full season. I, I think it's just being able to get innings and get tape and figure out who you are as a person, as a personality, and what you want to come across on radio and television. So I, I think the indie ball route is huge now because when we broke into the industry, or a lot of us did, uh, there were more minor league baseball teams than there are now. Uh, just with minor league baseball cutting it down to 120 teams, all the Atlanta League jobs and the Frontier League jobs and the Can-Am jobs, the American Association, the Atlantic League, I mean, they're much more important now. So just finding out all those leagues, finding the contacts in those leagues, whether it's the general manager, AGM, director of marketing, the current director of media relations, and just initially setting up emails, calls, just, hey, I don't know what your broadcast situation is like for the coming season. Um, would love to pick your brain for the next, yeah, for 10 or 15 minutes sometime this week. I usually go the informal route, uh, but just informational. The more people you know, the better off you're going to be. So just make those contacts within minor league baseball teams, any ball teams, college wood, bat league teams, um, and then just getting experience, um, getting in front of a microphone, calling games, getting tape. And whether that is, you know, going into an empty press box in a minor league stadium, bringing your own equipment and calling nine innings or getting paid to do so. You need to get innings. You need to get that real, whether it's a half inning, highlight reel package, one full inning. You, you need a, a media and a broadcast presence and getting innings and recording it and having on file. Um, I think that's the start. So I think one, getting experience two, not being afraid to reach out to people via email and getting on things like this, you know, phone calls like this where you get to learn a little bit more and then branch off and touch base with all of us individually. Because I think that, you know, all six of us probably have different experience on how we broke into the industry and how you can break into the industry. 
Yeah, I'd say, uh, Alex, you hit just about everything that I was going to be touching on. But uh, I'll say even if if you're at a point where you're not ex- exactly sure where like you come from, like an internship or job opportunity, something that I used to do when I was like really young, even before I wanted to be a broadcaster, was I would I really enjoyed playing sports uh, video games. And those are really popular now. And even like there was during the COVID-19 pandemic when you really couldn't go anywhere or do much of anything there. You can always turn down that game that you're playing and call the action along the way. I apparently have tapes from when I was like five, six years old of me doing that. I have yet to hear them. I don't know if I want to, to be honest, but uh, there are, there are just so many different ways now I think than there were even like five years ago that, people can get as many reps as they can. But uh, something to really be on the lookout for too is like, you know, maybe reach out to your uh, high school if you're anywhere nearby and see if like they need somebody to call games or you can go to just about any game. And this story I've heard from various uh, broadcasters is you could just do like a voice memo on your phone or something like that to get some kind of tape going. But uh, in terms of you know, getting your foot in the door with these organizations, connections, relationships, uh, emailing. If you're able to meet in person, that's e- that's an even uh, better thing that you're able to do. Um, and if you are still at the college uh, level, be on the lookout for, you know, things that your college is uh, potentially advertising. I was just, I just happen to be thankful that my uh, college had that partnership with my team and I was able to look into that, apply for it and get there. But uh there are many different outlets and with social media and the internet, it there are lots of places and people that are way more accessible than I think they used to be. I think Logan brought up a really good point, just being able to contact all the people that are in your area. Um, I think if you guys have disposable income right now, I would buy a $120 mixer and a headset um, and that mixer that plugs into your laptop. And I, if you don't have work over a summer, Reach out to all the minor league baseball teams in the area and see if they have any auxiliary booth where you can come in and record a demo broadcast. I know for us, even at the AAA level, there are certain teams that still don't travel because of COVID. So we have an open booth. Yeah, We have 75 home games. We have an open booth, 35 of those games. So if you email me and say, hey, I'm in Iowa, can I come record a demo? Odds are we'll be able to find a, find a date to make it work it. So you'll be in the visiting radio booth. You'll open up the window. You'll have your own headset. You'll have a you know uh, a computer. You'll have your mixer, and you'll be able to basically record a AAA game and get those demo innings. And all you have to do is reach out to somebody like me, or reach out to somebody like Logan or Emma. So I would highly recommend that if you don't end up getting a job and you're not broadcasting games during the summer, there's probably five or six teams, indie ball, affiliated ball teams that are within a hundred mile radius. Contact them. Yeah, I I like that a lot. I can also attest to the voice memo thing. In college, I would go to random high school games and stand on the sidelines and call it into my phone, drive by drive, and then send it out to get critique. So there are ways now with technology, you know, even look at your local high school just to get reps and feel the pace of baseball and stuff too. Um, So let's say that you get the reps. um, How do you, how does one stand out from the fields and get noticed um, to increase chances of getting an interview? Um, we'll start with, uh, with you, Jesse. First thing is be polished in what you've got. So make sure that your writing skills are polished when you're writing that introductory email or that cover letter, that you're to the point, you're not overwriting, you know how to use your words in order to get your point across. Same thing with the resume, one page relevant skills. If that team is interviewing for a job with these skills, make sure those relevant skills are at the fore. People don't care about anything else that you've done that is different from that unless it's filling in other aspects of your personality. So we'll look at that secondarily. And then beyond that, it's what do you bring to help that team be better? So if that team is hiring a sales position slash broadcaster, that sales matters. If that team is hiring something else beyond that broadcaster, that matters. I also would like to add to this. There are so many people who work for teams who are like me, older, and they might not have the skills that are coming out right now. As in, if you are mastering the ways to, uh, there are going, there's going to be something that comes out during this season or next season that I might not understand yet. 
And so whether I'm talking about social media platforms, whether I'm talking about new technologies, things are always getting introduced. Understand how to learn and then put it to your benefit because people who are ensconced with teams generally are not constantly learning about what's new and how it can help. If you have that skill and you can say to the team, you're not doing this, I can do this, then that builds upon the broadcast skills that I hope you've already started to perfect through all of your demo work and all of your calling video games and sitting in at the high school arena. All of that that you're working on with yourself combined with all those other skills, that helps you stand out. Teams don't have you already. Love that. Um, Steven, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I think the biggest thing that Jesse kind of hit on, though, is being able to do other things than it is just broadcasting. You know, I, for instance, do media relations and community relations, but I first started as media relations and community relations and worked into a broadcasting sense. You want to be able to have other skills that are going to help a team benefit in general and then taking your broadcasting skills into a marketing aspect and helping on that regard or helping a sponsorship regard in general. But another huge thing is the, the that's so crucial is the ability to send a proper email, being able to spell our names correctly, making sure that you can focus on what your goal is of it. If you're just trying to get a job, there's a difference between getting a job and making a connection. You know, there's there's a difference in saying, hey, I would love to maybe connect and learn more more about your organization than just give me a job because that can also matter too. You don't want to come off pushy to organizations that are trying to help you. Um, that is a huge aspect that I think I would include to what Jesse already said. All right, so let's now move into the nitty gritty of the reel and shaping your reel that you're gonna partner with that cover letter, with that resume. Um, I'll ask this to, to John and Josh. Uh, what are you looking for in a reel um, if you're looking to hire or maybe what's in your reel right now uh, on the baseball side of things? Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, I'm really big into like show don't tell with my resume materials and stuff like that. So like on a resume, if you're saying, hey, I'm an expert in graphic design, I don't want your resume to be done in Word, like do it in InDesign, do it in Photoshop, show me that you can do that. Um, that way you're not just blending in with the, the rest of the pack that's using those Word templates. And then from uh, from the real aspect, you know, I, I want to see a little bit of all the different things you do. So if you're saying that you're bilingual, I think I saw that somewhere um, in the chat. Okay, show me an interview that you did with a Spanish speaking player where you're speaking some Spanish and you're translating it for your listener. Uh, and then, you know, show me some highlights. I typically say less than 90 seconds of highlights to start. Once we've heard three or four, we've heard them all. Um, and then, you know, give me a solid half inning or two solid half innings um, where you're showing me not just your walk-off home run, right? A lot of people can, can scream and sound really awesome for their walk-off home runs, but show me how you're carrying that random July game in July when it's the fifth inning and it's seven to three with, you know, a double, a triple or, you know, something in there. So there's a little bit of action, but uh, that you're kind of just able to to carry during the, I don't want to call it dull moments, but during the mundane average moments uh, of July when you're in game number 120 out of 160. Yeah, so to go off what uh, John said, typically when it comes to the real, uh, I think a highlight is good because it gets people hopefully energized into the work that you're doing. Um, obviously you don't want something too over the top because some folks, especially some of you young guys tend to really scream and that can be as big of a turnoff as a, as opposed to, uh, what you're looking to do. But I usually just do one highlight, um, you know, a little 20 to 30 second thing. I would prefer that it be, uh, something other than a home run. I mean, how do you sound on a two run double or a, a, a two run single, something like that, or a tremendous diving catch. Because home run calls, uh, there are a dime a dozen. I want to hear what you sound like when maybe something not as spectacular as a home run happens. And then for the the meat of it, the uh, the inning portion, yeah, I want to hear the top of the second during a May 3rd game when it's scoreless and there's a walk to start the inning. How can you carry a broadcast? Because baseball, you could get a two and a half hour to a three hour ball game. How are you going to sound when there's not a whole lot happening? 
I need to hear you during your mundane moments. If you're just showing me highlights, which I've gotten some you know, resumes with that, you're not telling me anything. Uh, and then to top it off, and this is something I need to work on with myself, is you know, getting an interview and showing things like that are just as important as the in-game broadcast because whether you're applying for a major league job or a minor league job, your first step in the door probably isn't going to be the number one play-by-play -play man. So how do you sound during a pregame? Give me a scoreboard update. Um, how do you sound uh, giving an interview? Those little things are little are things that can get you in the door as a broadcaster and not just the play-by-play -play man. All right. I'm now going to address this to, I think, Jesse and Alex. We had a question in the chat um, about prep. Um, you know, and they're saying a lot of the, uh, you know, college uh, teams, you have player bio pages, all that kind of stuff. How do y'all prep? Um, and then I guess kind of talk a little bit about what we are, we have access to on the, the professional baseball side. Go ahead, yeah. Alex. Uh, Alex. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, my prep, as I, I won't say is different than, than it has been over the last couple of years. Uh, but really, since COVID, I've tried to find more ways to be conversational and interactive. So I'll, I'll just go through a day. You know, let's say we have a 708 game, 705 game. I'll get in at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'll go over some tapes from the following night. I'll look at some trends. Uh, really just bide some time until the players and coaches get there. Uh, uh, when the players and coaches get there, I try to have one unique conversation every day. And it doesn't have to be with a player. It doesn't have to be with a coach. Um, it could be with a trainer. It could be with a clubby. It could be with somebody from the other team. It could be our general manager. But something to break up the monotony of 150 games in 162 days. So when it is July and it's game five of six and you've lost the previous four and you're down 10 to one, you can rely on that 10-minute conversation that you had with uh, a bench player who just got called up from double a who might know somebody from the other team. Um, it just makes each and every broadcast a little bit different. And I've really tried to hone in every day, making sure that those 10 minutes are pertinent, that I can get the right information out of them, that those conversations flow organically. Um, so making sure that I have those conversations going up here and Emma was talking about what we have at our disposal. I mean, it's not just the stats portal, but, you know, we have great media relations departments that put together these daily game notes anywhere between four and 14 pages. Go through them. I mean, even if you don't find anything on the first page, you might find something on the second. You might find a nugget on the third. It might be something on the 10th. You, know, you look at, you know, the, the games and list by list who won, who didn't, time of game. You'll be able to find trends through them. So I really make it a part to go through the game notes, not just because – I know the media relations department puts a lot of work into those, but some of the information is really good. So I, I know that a lot of people on here do both media relations and broadcasting. I don't do media relations. So I do play, I do broadcasting. Um, I'm also the travel coordinator and I do sales. So especially because I'm not as looped in into putting together the game notes and contextualizing all that on paper, I want to make sure that I'm able to get that information. So I probably spend an hour, hour and 15 minutes on just game notes, perusing through, looking at trends. Uh, baseball reference is also my best friend, especially the minor league tools. So I'll go through that and um, see if, if certain players swing the bat well on the road against certain teams, month by month breakdown. So I'm a big trends guy. So I, I think that one looking at the data, um, either in the game notes or on baseball reference is important. And then being conversational, having a unique conversation with somebody, making sure that if Let's say you haven't talked to the guys in the bullpen or the pitching coach in a while. Talk to them because it gives you a different perspective. A couple of ways that I like to prepare to learn more about our guys, since let's say we don't have that college bio at our disposal. This broadcast network, if I had a player who played with Rocket City, I'm going to contact Josh and say, what do you got? If there's a player who I know Alex broadcasted his games, I'll say, what do you have on him? It's so good to go back in because you can find which teams a player played for. And then from there, I can just type into YouTube, was an interview done with him? Which broadcasters called his games? And from there, the other thing that I love to do, and this might be connoted negatively, I'm an eavesdropper. I'll just walk out there on batting practice. Or I'll stand at the, at the dugout railing 
and I'll watch everything. And from that, I can get to know which players are funny, which players are saying what, what they're talking about, which helps me start up conversations with them, which leads to things that we can then talk about on the air. So it's all about putting yourself around, building that foundation. If Josh says to me that this guy is a super fan of Sylvester Stallone, I don't know. He has watched every single episode of this soap opera. That gives me something to build off of because it's my job to tell you, the listener, a little bit more about him. And these are all jumping off points to uh, start up that relationship and say, here's a little bit more about this guy. You know, one thing uh, Jesse's doing that I really like is he's talking about things other than stats. I just saw someone mention stats here. And one thing that, and we're all, I think we were all guilty of this early in our careers, is that stats become a crutch. Um, you can only say so-and-so is hitting X, Y, Z in this situation, and here's his batting average for the year with this home run. Ugh. You give so many numbers, your viewer or listener is going to get dull. It's going to get bored, and he's going to, you know, they're all going to crisscross each other. So finding those little nuggets about people on the human side, you know, what is their favorite soap opera? What's their favorite food? Where did they grow up? Is there a story from high school that's interesting? Broadcasting and play-by-play -play in particular is about storytelling. Yeah, you need to sprinkle in stats. We all get that. But it's the storytelling that keeps people engaged when it is 10 to 1 in the fifth inning. So uh, it's not just about uh, the score, the game on the field, because the game on the field, quite frankly, can be terrible. What I want to hear is, what are you going to do to keep me engaged when the score is out of hand or when it's a dull moment in the game or when there's really not much of a reason to listen to me other than to hear this really neat story about this player. And that's just about digging and talking to guys and talking to other broadcasters and learning as much as you can. Yeah, I really like that, Josh. That's a really good point. Um, another question, and, and Alex kind of alluded to it also, is what are our roles outside of just – calling the games um, each night. I guess I'll talk a little bit about what I do in Portland. Um, and then John, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about what you do in Columbia as well. But um, yeah, broadcasting is not just what I do here. Um, I also help out with the media relations. So those game notes that Alex was talking about, that's what I do every single day. Um, and it can take anywhere from one to two hours, depending on the game before. If it's a franchise record game, the game before, then that's going to take a little while to update all of that, all of those um, printing out all of the stat packs for both clubhouses, monitoring the rosters. Um, if the Red Sox have a, a roster move that day, I'm the one that's actually sending it in and updating it. Um, you know, talking with our manager, making sure everything is, is up to date. We're all on the same page, um, grabbing a player for an interview, um, you know, just kind of really chatting before the game. And again, that's kind of how I prep as well as long, as well as those game notes, um, you know, and in the off season right now, I have one more section of my media guide and then I'll be done. Um, that's well over a hundred pages. We're working on the program. Um, so the media relations side, writing, all of those skills are so important. Uh, you know, for me to be year round with the Sea Dogs, um, some teams don't offer that, uh, that don't give that uh, opportunity, but helps me, you know, stay at the ballpark year round. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think media relations heavy and having the relationships with your big league club and the clubhouses, being able to be trustworthy with those as well um, is really key. But yeah, definitely more than just the broadcast. And I know, John, you know, your job in Columbia probably looks different than than mine. Yeah, so I do the same thing as Emma with the media relations, right? We're putting together roster moves, we're putting together stat packs, we're putting together those game notes that Alex touched on. But um, I'm also a corporate salesperson. So like we released our promo schedule and part of releasing our promo schedule is all those game sponsorships that I sold this off season are part of that, right? The presented buys that you're going to see. Um, that's a really good way to kind of get your foot in the door. A lot of organizations might not see the value of adding a secondary broadcaster for that first gig, but if you're able to say like, Hey, I'm going to be able to sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of sponsorship or groups or whatever it might be. Um, then now you found yourself a role where you could become potentially a full-time member of a front office, particularly in, you know, a ball uh, where they just don't have enough bodies to call every company or every, you know, person uh, that's within that market. So sales uh, can be a really important thing to do. Uh, the other aspect that I hear a lot of people um, talk about is marketing and advertising. Um, I've done a little bit of that. Like we started to transition some of our commercial writing and stuff like that, where I'm starting to um, 
you know, lead the charge on our cumulus deals and our iHeart deals, as well as our NBC deals. So, um, I mean, you're kind of a jack of all trades, but um, it's every day you're learning a little bit on the job. And I think that's one of the things that are so fun about uh, minor league baseball. Does anyone else want to add kind of what their day-to-day looks like if it's a little bit different than ours? Yeah. Um, in Fresno, I actually do community relations. Um, I do all of our donations. I do all of our school initiatives. So we have a Wild About Reading program. You read 10 books in five weeks, you get two free tickets to a game. We also do a, um, a couple games, our day games, where kids can come out for free for school events. Um, they get an assembly, free lunch, so on and so forth. And it's really cool to be able to do those community related events during the season, but also in the off season as well, because not only do I get my name out there, I get our organization's name out there, which allows us to not only help out with sponsorship sales or ticket uh, sales, but it also allows you guys to then go and say, Hey, you know, I am the voice of the Grizzlies or Emma goes out and says, Hey, I'm the voice of the sea dogs, you know, so on and so forth. Or they're going out and saying, this is what we, we do. It allows you guys to not only connect to the community, but then they can tune into a game and say, hey, I know I, who that person is. I met them at this event. Um, and so it adds on to the stuff that I even do and actually will help with the prep that you guys were talking about as well, where, you know, it's a sponsorship night presented by Verizon Wireless. We'll maybe talk a little bit about what Verizon Wireless brings on your night as well, too. So it adds to another story that even relates to the game, but also can relate to your people as well talk about phones maybe how people interact with the phones and now you've helped a sponsor you've helped the community and now you've helped maybe talk about the players and what they're involved with as well jesse your hand is up i'm the web guy <laughs> i came out of college with no web skills and it just with teams that i've been on there are just some things that they go "Uh oh we don't have anyone to do this quick jesse learn this and so every team that I've been on, they've said, hey, can you run the team website? And so I constantly have had to learn new team websites. And I've been the person in charge of the website. Also, they decided out of nowhere that they were going to start a Michigan Baseball Hall of Fame. So, hey, Jesse, figure out how to run a Hall of Fame. It, it very much is this skill is something that you're not born with but you just have to figure it out. And so it's contacting people, it's working through people and people have grace. And then through that work and through that uh, ability to learn and that need to just keep on making things a little bit better, you go, all right, now I'm the web guy. Well, I also think an unspoken responsibility um, that I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we've all done it at least once in our careers is uh, tart pulls, um, always being ready uh, and on call for pulling the tart because we do not have major league grounds crews. Uh, we do it all ourselves. Um, all right. So moving on, um, I think and whoever has uh, assistance typically with them, I guess this would be kind of geared towards you. Uh, but what are you looking for in an assistant? It's an entry level job, typically somebody's first season uh, in minor league baseball, very green, whether on the mic or even knowing our hours and, and that commitment. Uh, but what are you looking for uh, for an assistant, specific skills, personality traits, anything like that? Whoever wants to start can kick us off. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, and only because we've actually just made a change with my assistant. Uh, the first three years, we had a, a guy who did a really good job for me. And uh, he, he was strictly a numbers guy. He loved media notes. He loved stats. He That's what he loved to do. And he was great at it. The problem was he couldn't do anything else. Um, his skill set was very limited. And unfortunately, after three years, we decided to part with him because we knew he would never be able to grow into a full-time role. So uh, the new guy who we hired, who is right now an intern, a paid hourly intern. Um, he's a, a guy who has done some broadcasts, but really I'm hiring him more so to do the other stuff, to do the stat packs, to do the game notes, to do uh, the roster changes and things like that, because frankly, that's just more important than the broadcast is. And uh, I flat out told him, look, if you do a great job with this stuff, I'll get you three innings a, a night on air for home games. I have no problem doing that but I need this other stuff done. And so that has been priority number one to me. And also, and what I hope he's able to do that maybe the predecessor wasn't able to do 
which is, can you do something else beyond this? Are you going to pick up the phone and make 20 calls a day for sales? Are you going to help out with ops and painting the, a sidewall that needs to be fixed? Um, you know, just the more you can do, the better off you're going to be. And that's what we're all looking for because in this industry, we all have to wear different hats. If you're wearing only one, you're in a lot of trouble. So the more you bring to the table, the more that it's going to help not just the organization, but yourself as an employee. I can add briefly onto that. In terms of number twos, you've got to be able, like, it's, I always tell my number two, it's the two of us against the world. There is nobody else in that front office who understands what we do. Uh, and it's the same thing for the groundskeeper in a minor league office. People do not get you. And it's the fans, players, they all think that this is different. They think that you're going single A, double A, triple A, major leagues just like them. You're not. Um, single A and triple A broadcasters can be at the exact same ability level. They can be different backgrounds, different ages. It's where you are in the country, how you help out in that team front office, and then what are the asks of you in building relationships with media and everything else. So it very much is you're looking for someone that you can really trust. So everything that Josh said is paramount. And then you need to like you need to have that chemistry in order to say when things are breaking down around us, that the two of us will get it done. Steven, you have your hands up. Yeah, I think going off of what Jesse said, too, I mean, you have to have someone that you trust. You know, if someone is about to go on maternity leave, you want to make sure that you have someone they can trust to bring in and do all your stuff that you're doing. But I also think you have to have someone that can follow directions easily. If you write five things down that they can do all five of those things without any worry or limited questions. I think that, you know, we're all grown ups. We're able to do a lot of different things. But if you're not able to follow a direction of, hey, I need this bio done on this player, and all of a sudden you're giving me 10 questions about this player, then all of a sudden you're taking time away from what you've been asked to do. And, you know, it's not hard to go look up maybe a player on a baseball reference and to be able to use those aspects. Um, you know, our my person last year, Jack, was probably the best person I could have ever asked for because he also had a love for the things that I had a love for from – even as crazy as food uh, to, of course, sports, but also someone who had a passion about not only helping our community, but also helping the team long term and also had aspirations to continue on other paths and maybe even weren't broadcasting, uh, helping out on doing little aspects like that. John? I guess kind of going off that, um, all of us work ridiculous hours during the summer. So it's what can save me the most time. And it might sound simple, but like if my goal is to get the recap done within 15 minutes of the game ending uh, and you can help write that recap during the game and I don't have to go back and reread and proofread, then, you know, that's a huge get for you. If uh, you're able to do game notes because you've done that already and I'm not teaching you how to go through InDesign and how to go through, you know, whatever program I'm using for that, that's bigger to me than being green on the mic, right? Like, uh, the the broadcasting is going to come as I think a couple people, particularly Alex, have said on this with reps. The more innings you call, the better you're going to end up sounding on the mic. So what, what I'm looking for are those other things that we have to do every single day that might allow me to come in at 11 instead of 10 a.m. if I'm staying until 11 or midnight that night. Yeah, I'll also add, um, you know, for me, I think that I love to have an assistant who's not afraid to make mistakes. Um, my, In my opinion, with my position, I really want this person to go on and have a number one job the next season. That's my goal for this position. Um, and to do that, to grow in that, we're going to mess up together. We're going to learn from it. We're going to move on. Um, you know, I always give... I'll critique the tapes of my my assistants while I'm on the road. I have a little more extra time. Um, but someone who's who's not afraid to make a mistake because I'm not going to berate you for it. You're new to this job. Um, I'm never going to put you down for it. We're going to you know talk about it, work through it, and then move on. Um, I still make plenty of mistakes, and I laugh about it. I, I will laugh about it, call myself out, out on air for it. Um, that's just who I am. And um, just kind of having an assistant that understands the importance of being able to have a little freedom to be yourself to grow in the position um, and know that it's not going to be super easy all season and, and, you know, rainbows and butterflies, we're going to learn from some mistakes um, is really big for me. Um, so I think Logan, if you want to start this one off and then anyone else can, can chime in. Uh, but 
once you, you know, were into minor league baseball, um, how did you find your voice uh, and, and kind of your broadcast style? Yeah, you know, I, I think it just goes along with that theme of the more innings you call, the more comfortable you're going to be. Uh, because uh, like very first series of the season, we had just gotten set up with, you know, uh, MILB.TV and just a, a like brand new setup. We had a lot of a brand new staff and uh, it was my uh, first time really like taking the lead for a uh, baseball broadcast. So uh, it was a little bit of, I guess, tough waters, if you want to use the uh, captain's pun there, I guess. Uh, but, you know, as the season progressed and even like listening to other broadcasters too, and like, you know, thinking of different styles and uh, techniques that you might like from others, you know, kind of blending it together and making it into your own. Um, but something that I think is said often, but it does reign true, is that like, you're you. You are the only you that there is. And that is the most unique thing that you can bring to the table, no matter where you are, who you're broadcasting for, what sport you're broadcasting. Uh, but in terms of baseball, I think really getting a knack for understanding the rhythm of the game, especially, you know, it's gotten a little bit faster at times with the uh, pitch clock, different rules and everything. Um, but I think it's just the more you do it, the better. And if you don't have an opportunity yet, again, you can go to any game that you want, turn on any game on TV, play any video game that you have, uh, and get any kind of reps that you can because, uh, you know, I've heard something where it says like, uh, success is where opportunity and preparation meet. So if you're prepared and you see an opportunity that you have, you are going to find your voice. Jesse? I think finding your voice is hard because let's say you're blessed with a wonderful voice. That's great. But so many of us don't understand naturally how to use our diaphragm, how to breathe the right way, right? How to, how to open up the back of your throat. There are all sorts of different things that I did not understand. And so I actually found, uh, found a local speaking coach, local vocal coach here in the Lansing area in order to understand the healthy way to go about using my voice. So then now I'm understanding how to use my voice better. And now I need to get back to being natural because you need to speak in that way that, that right. You need to project, you need to open things up. You need to be resonant, but you also need to sound like a person and you need to be broadcasting that person sitting on their couch. So that's where the reps and finding your audience and connecting is so important. This is where self-critique is so important. But I always come back to my cheat is broadcast the game to somebody specific. Find that specific person and call the game right to them. And that way someone on their couch will feel like you're calling it to them. But it all starts with making sure that you're breathing in a healthy manner. Alex. Now we're good. Uh, the best piece of advice that I could give you guys uh, when it comes to finding your voice is it takes time. Like you're not going to get on a broadcast and, you know, month one, month two into it and be able to find your voice. It took me, I think, a thousand games broadcasting to find my voice to really feel comfortable on air the way that I was enunciating the you know authoritative in my voice on a big call. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of trial and error. I think Emma brought up a really good point. Do not be afraid to screw up. If you're not screwing up, either you're afraid to make mistakes or you should be in the big leagues because I screw up every game, every inning. And that's how you learn. Like it's a lot of trial and even more error. So just knowing that and going into each broadcast saying like, I'm going to screw up. Uh, I might do nine things wrong. Let's correct one of them the next day and let's correct the other one the next day. And then, or do it week by week or month by month. Like you're not just broadcasting for one year so you can get the perfect reel to move on to the big leagues. This is a decade, you know, half a century long prophecy that you guys are about to try to join. So it's going to take some time. Um, so just be patient and know that even the best in our industry it takes a lot of time to really feel comfortable on air and be comfortable with yourself and be comfortable with your voice. 
if I can piggy up, pig, but, uh, piggyback off that, um, Alex talks about finding your voice. It took me at least five years before I found mine, and it wasn't even in baseball. Um, when I got out of baseball, I went into news for about three years, and it was in news where I finally found my rhythm because for the first time in my life, I was broadcasting year round. Uh, when you're doing baseball and you're a seasonal employee and you're only calling games six months out of a year, uh, th that can actually hold back your uh, development, especially if you don't have a lot lined up in the off season. When I got into news, it was the first broadcast job I had where I was behind the mic every single day. And even though I wasn't doing baseball and even though I wasn't on three hours a night, just being able to practice and repeat and rinse and repeat again and again and again, that's what allowed me to get better. And so I guess uh, another element to all this I want to give everyone is whether you are doing baseball this summer or next summer or not, as long as you can get behind a microphone, you're moving in the right direction. So whatever you can do to help uh, help grow your skills, even if it's in baseball or not, it's only going to make you better as a broadcaster on a whole, and you never know what will pop up down the line. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... We're getting closer to the four o'clock hour, but I uh, want to get a couple more questions in. Um, somebody asked about uh, what was, oh, I lost it. Um, the most valuable lesson you learned uh, early in your career from a mentor or um, supervisor or somebody. Um, you know, I think a quick one that I have uh, before somebody else wants to chime in um, was for my grandfather. He uh, was listening to one of my early tapes, which let's just not talk about those anymore, um, was to get word, rid of the word get. Um, you know, you can have a fly ball to right field. The, the outfielder gets back, makes the catch. Well, how does he get back? Does he sprint? Does he jog? Does he uh, take a couple steps back? There's always opportunity for more details. And so I've taken that into what I do on a day-to-day -day basis of, okay, get is fine, but we're looking for better than fine. We're looking for great. We're looking for awesome. Um, so that goes to my game notes. That goes to the relationships we have in the clubhouse. Um, just making sure that you're not settling for mediocrity. You're pushing yourself every single day, whether it's in the broadcast coming up with new uh, verbiage to to talk about just a routine fly ball, or it's, you know, pushing yourself and trying to make a better media guide. Something like that um, is something that I kind of have taken with me uh, ever since then. So uh, Alex, I think you had your hand up first. Did I get it right this time? Now I can actually talk not on me. Finally, I figured it out. Um, I have two things that I learned really early on that helped. One of them is one word, smile. Smile. If you're not happy and you're not excited, odds are the listeners are not going to be happy and they're not going to be excited. Like you can hear a smile. And I know that sounds cliche and I know that sounds odd, but you know, people know if you're happy and you're excited about baseball or if you're not. So, and I know that that's tough. And, you know, again, game five of a six game series, you've lost four straight, you're down 10 to one. You have every single thing against you. Find a way to be happy. If you have to make a joke to yourself to smile, do it. Um, yeah. And then another one would be take a deep breath before every half an inning. Yeah. You, know, you get the countdown, you're coming back in 10, nine, eight. Take a deep breath. Let it go with three seconds left because that'll bring you down from like an eight to a six. So then you can go up for that exciting moment. You're not just always there because let's say you're there and you get a two run home run. There's not that much room to go up from there. So I think taking a deep breath before ha every half an inning, which, which I do. And I started early on in my career really helps recalibrate you to like a neutral point. Um, so you can go down, so you can go up, so you're calm. So it doesn't sound like you're, you know, your voice is, you know, air sucked out of a helium balloon. So I, I I think just controlling your breathing and finding that baseline before every half an inning and just making sure you're happy. If if you're not happy and you're not excited, fans aren't going to be able to enjoy it and you probably are going to do something else at some point. So that's what I would, I would say. Jesse. Two quick things. The first is the understanding that the brain and the mouth do not work at the same speed. And in order to put them up at the same speed that I've got a gesture, that if I'm saying, uh, um, uh, that's my mouth moving quicker than my brain. My mouth wants to talk. My brain isn't ready. That if I start tripping over my words, that my brain is ready and the brain is clicking and the mouth isn't ready. 
And so just using my hands to gesture helped put the brain and the mouth together. And the second thing is the understanding that you should not call play-by-play with long sentences, that everything should get broken up. And because you want to allow your brain a chance to process what you see, the key is lag. So for example, the pitch, ground ball, third base, backhanded, plants, throws, got them at first. Everything is very short. Everything is very to the point. In basketball, it's the same thing, right? Left wing, baseline drive, crosses over, flips it up, got it. Making sure that the play-by-play isn't a sentence, that you've got those nice little things, and that helps you not get too far out in front. That helps you react to unexpected things that occur. That was a really big thing for me to learn. That's awesome. John? Yeah, so I think um, where a lot of like really young broadcasters will struggle is being conversational. And I really struggled with that when I was first breaking into baseball. Um, And ultimately, my mentor sat me down one day because he said, hey, when we go out afterwards and we chat at the bar, you're always totally fine at being conversational. It's just when you get that headset on, you're overthinking it. So one day he literally just brought a Bud Light into the booth and he was like, I want you to talk to me like we're at the bar. And just that clicked. And at that point, I understood what he meant by I'm not being conversational. I stopped being staccato. I stopped you know, like overthinking for that perfect word and just literally talking to the audience. So um, sometimes, like as crazy as it sounds, we try and overcomplicate it in our mind to be perfect. But at the end of the day, just talk to your audience, have that great conversation like you're talking to your best friend at the bar, like you're talking to your grandma on the telephone, and and then you're going to be a lot better. Logan. Yeah, uh, something that I was told pretty early on is that every game is a big game. Even if the stakes aren't there, say, I don't know, it's the bottom two teams in your division, you're both out of the playoffs. You know, every opportunity is something that you should not take for granted. And even too, it's a big game because, you know, so-and-so's in the batter's box. That's someone's son. That's someone's cousin, nephew, friend, what have you. Uh, you know, there these no matter where you are, the stakes are big because these games mean a lot to, you know, certain people. Like, even if it's not the most well-known league, there's people, there's people in this league and that you work with and that know the team, the diehard fans. So every game means a lot to somebody and that's how you need to call every game as it is a big game. Uh, I'll say, and by the way, I'm sorry, I haven't raised my hand. I don't know how to do that, but um, I'll just have three very quick things. Uh, Number one, and and it goes back to uh, what Alex said, if be sure you smile, but I think specifically um, have some excitement in your voice, even when it is 10 to one in the fifth inning, you got to find a way to keep yourself motivated and excitement will do that. And what I mean is if you feel that you're bored and you feel that the broadcast is dry, chances are it probably is just try for the next half inning at a, at a bit of a quicker pace and then go back and listen to that the next day and compare it to the rest of your broadcast and say to yourself, is this working for me? Because maybe that's just that slight little uptick in your pacing well, not only will it make the broadcast sound better, but it will re-energize you. So that's number one. Typically, it's all about pacing. And uh, Logan, I'm going to disagree with you slightly in this one regard. You're right. It is someone's son and every game is important. But I think it's so essential to know time and place within a game. So if Joe Schmo goes up there and hits a solo home run in the top of the second inning, you don't want it to sound like game seven of the World Series because it's not. It's not. It's it's early May, and it's a typical home run, and some people just blow themselves out of the water over those things when you really need to hold that back to the ninth inning when the game's on the line. Um, Brian Anderson taught me that one time. He was showing me uh, a guy who was nailing a bunch of three-pointers uh, during an NCAA tournament game. He had like 10 of them over the course of a game. Three-pointer one and two in the first half is not the same as three-pointer nine and ten in the second. So just – Understand your pace and don't ever forget to pause. Uh, I have to remind myself of this all the time. What's beautiful about baseball baseball is its ambiance, the crack of the bat, the murmuring in the crowd, uh, the the vendor, the peanut vendor asking, uh, does anyone want peanuts or beer or whatever? That's what makes baseball unique. So don't forget maybe once or twice half an inning, 
Just let it breathe. Let it pause. Let your voice rest and allow the ambiance of the game to take over. That's awesome. Um, well, we're at four o'clock, but I want to pose the the kind of million dollar question. It's kind of a, a quick answer to it, but uh, besides teamwork online, are there any recommendations of where to find uh, job postings? I know teamwork uh, is the hotbed for for a lot of minor league jobs, um, but does anyone have any recommendations of how to find open jobs for any upcoming seasons? Yeah, I mean, I think SDAA, as most of you know, is a good one. Also, I've seen a lot more just on X, just with you know, teams with their own respective Twitter accounts saying, hey, we either need a broadcaster for X day or X season. Um, make sure you go on there and follow the teams that you'd want to work for or you're looking into because sometimes they need a more, you know, they have an imminent need. They have uh, open that they need to have filled and they know that people follow them on Twitter and on Facebook and they'll post it there. Um, I've seen that more in the, like the last year or two that on Twitter or on X or whatever they call it, um, they will have job postings on there and they will probably put them on there before they do teamwork or SDAA or anything like that. Jesse? I believe in the broadcaster network. So I believe that if you want to know what's going on in the league, you reach out to other broadcasters in that league. So you build a relationship. If you want to know about the Florida State League, find the other broadcasters in the Florida State League and start building that relationship. Because generally, when a broadcaster leaves their job, they send out an email to all of the other broadcasters in the league and they say, I'm heading out. So the broadcaster might go, all right, so that team is going to have an opening. You then know about that opening. You know about which teams generally want to hire for a number two. So it's it's localizing and it's a lot of work but you've actually got to go into that league and get the scouting report. And that way, too, you can learn, is this a bad job? What is a job that is a good job? What job could become open? Lay that foundation. It's hard. SDAA Teamwork Online, here's the job opening. Let's go. But I think it's very much worthwhile to learn more about the different places. Not all positions, not all teams are created equal. Don't forget about LinkedIn. Uh, because you'll hear player, you'll hear about folks who are moving on to other jobs through that, especially if you connect with them. So that's another great opportunity. In fact, I just landed a uh, fill-in college basketball gig this weekend because one of my followers works in the athletics department at a school. She happened to post that they were looking for a broadcaster, and boom, there you go. So don't forget about LinkedIn either. Oh, and again, don't forget to reach out to the teams directly as well. We might not necessarily get back to you because we don't have a need and we're just too busy to respond to anyone, but it never hurts to send an email and an attachment. If we'd like you, we'll call you. If we if we don't have a need, you know, I will try to respond to as many people as possible. But if I don't respond to you, don't take it personally. It's just that the need's not there. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It's after four o'clock, so that we're going to call it a wrap on this. Um, but hopefully everyone walked away with at least one constructive thing. Um, you know, I think we're all here to, to help everyone, you know, get into the baseball industry. So feel free to shoot any of us an email. Uh, we'd be happy to listen to tape, talk to you a little bit about our jobs more, really answer any questions. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank our great panelists and, uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.